Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, we take a bonobo adventure with Vanessa Woods, author of Bonobo Handshake. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour with Dr. Kiki Sanford, episode 50 for Monday, June 14th, 2010. Monkey business. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. I'm Dr. Kiki, and it's time to settle in for some science. That's right. It's one hour, one expert, one topic, so it's time to get down and dirty with the bonobos. And here today to talk to us about bonobos and her wonderful book, Bonobo Handshake, is Vanessa Woods. Vanessa is a research scientist at Duke University, and she's also an award-winning journalist and science writer. She's written three children's books as well as, as having written for Discovery, uh, the Discovery Channel, BBC. Uh, what else? We've also got New Scientist and Travel Africa. There's some travel writing in there as well as a few memoirs of her life scouring the jungles of uh, Costa Rica, Africa, searching for monkeys, chimps, and yes, the bonobos. So without further ado, Vanessa, thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Dr. Kiki. Thanks for having me on your show. You're welcome. I'm so excited to get you. We've been, we met back in January and was it January, February, and it was just so neat to meet you. And then to like see, uh, your book actually end up getting out and getting published and now to I know, finally, I made it finally. Yeah, made it. <laughs> <laughs> was that, was that quite, was it quite a, a, a long haul to get that, get your, get your book published? Was this uh, harder or easier than your earlier books? Uh, this book was pretty much like ripping my guts out. Uh, it was a really <laughs> tough book to write, but I'm really glad it's over now and it's out and everybody can read it. Yay! Exactly. So, Bonobo Handshake is, is it's, it's an adventure tale. It's a, it's a tale of, um, of your adventure getting into love and uh, a, part of, a part of your life where you wanted to, to study chimpanzees and suddenly you're in the Congo studying bonobos. And can you give us a little bit of a, a summary about this particular book and what readers would have to look forward to? Sure. Well, I was just, I was just shocked, really. Um, I thought I was the only dumb one who didn't know about bonobos, but a lot of people don't even know what they are. And, you know, they're related to us by 98.7% of our DNA. They're our closest living relatives along with chimpanzees. And we just did a study at Duke and 25% of college educated people don't know what bonobos are. So I thought, what a wonderful wow. opportunity to write a book about all the cool stuff we've learned over the last five years. Yeah, absolutely. So what are bonobos? I mean, I, I, I did animal behavior back in, in university, so I'm you know versed in the, the chimp bonobo culture, but what's the difference? What are bonobos and what makes them special? So bonobos, um, as I said, they're our closest living relative. They only live in one place, which is the Democratic Republic of Congo. And while chimpanzees are male dominated, and I guess they share the light and the dark side of us. So, you know, they're capable of empathy, love. If you believe the recent news reports, they mourn their dead. Um, but they also have this kind of dark side to them, which is they have hunting, they have war, they can occasionally torture and kill each other. They beat their females, kill their infants. So, you know, this is kind of um, the side of us that we don't like to talk about very often, but you know, which is, and chimpanzees are just so important to understanding that. And the main difference is that um, bonobos, they look very similar to chimpanzees, but what we're interested in is their psychology because bonobos live in female dominated societies. They don't beat their infants. Um, the females are in charge, which I think works a lot better. 
I, I, I think that I think that you would make an awesome bonobo female, Dr. Kiki. And um, <laughs> so it's generally um, the females are in charge and there's no violence, no war. Nobody's ever seen a bonobo kill another bonobo. And, you know, their infants just have great lives. So what another interesting society for us to study since they're so closely related to us. And, yeah, we, we need bonobos. They're fascinating. And they're, they're, they're really rare as well. Like you said, they only live in the, in the Congo. And... I, when did we realize that these particular apes were distinct and different from, you know, the the chimpanzees, which we've been looking at as so similar to ourselves for all the aggression and you know, terrible things that, that chimpanzees do, as well as the wonderful, wonderful things. But when did we first realize that, uh, that bonobos were distinct? That's a great question, and it was it was late. It was 1933 that they were first recognised as a species. But um, because there was this dictator in Congo who ruled for four decades, no one could really get in to study them. And so, and then you know there was a question of their sex. Bonobos are not G-rated, and so they the media had a hard time publicising them. And because there was no new information coming out of scientists, and they lived in a country that only speaks French, that it was it was difficult for bonobos to get out there. So I would say only in the last couple of years, um, you know, with these regular research papers that we've been publishing and other groups have been publishing, have bonobos really got back into the news? I think it's fabulous that they have gotten into the news. I mean, I think it's that that human, we, we want to be better. We look at the, the terrible things that we do in this world, the war, the killing, and, you know, there's there's this irony, I think, of the, the bonobos who are this peaceful loving chimp species that um, are, they're living in one of the most terrible war, war stricken areas of the world, you know, and like to, to see the, in the news that there are these, these beautiful creatures that have these really great traits and the women are powerful and such a, you know. <laughs> <laughs> <My> lady. <laughs> <laughs> no power, like the Spice Girls did, like in 2001, whenever that was. Um, yes, yes, it is. It's it's ironic, but it's also very hopeful. I think that you know the to you know bonobos could be such a symbol to Congo and really to the rest of the world that you know it's just kind of like a bit of a reality check because we tend to think of intelligence on a linear scale and humans at the pinnacle but I mean for all our intelligence we haven't managed to live in a world or societies without violence and this is something that bonobos can do without even thinking about it so what better creature to study than <laughs> the only great ape that's really got it right how do you go about studying bonobos or for that matter any any species out in the wild i mean there are so few of them in the wild do you have captive populations or do you just have to go to the congo to study them we, we have to go to the Congo to study them, but we are so lucky because we work at Lolaya Bonobo, which is the world's only bonobo sanctuary. And um, so what happens is that the adults get killed for meat and the infants, uh, the hunters try and sell them as pets. But this is illegal in Congo. And so um, when these orphans get confiscated, they need somewhere to go. And this woman called Claudine Andre, she started Lolaya Bonobo, which means paradise of the bonobos in the local language. So this is an amazing place for us to go because we're interested in the psychology. We just kind of can't sort of sit in the wild and watch the animals. We really need to play games with them to figure out how they think. And so, yes, this, this is the best place in the world for us. And we're just, we're so lucky to be able to go there. Yeah, and I have a video that you have on your website that I'm going to bring up uh, here, yes. load it up so that yes. we can actually, yeah, so um, when I get it loaded up here, I would love it if you could, I'm not going to put the um, the audio up, but just show the video. So if you can just, um, you know, tell us what's going on um, in the video and if there are any individuals that are, uh, you know, that you if you know the names or whatever, point out whatever it is that uh, is really interesting. So... Sure. Without, let me see, I got it set up there. And okay, let's let's go through this. Oh, there they are. They are walking out in the morning. Look at the baby hanging onto her arm. Um, the interesting thing about bonobos is they love spending time in the water. And Jane Goodall recently came to the sanctuary and she's like, oh my God, I've seen chimpanzees in the water twice. But, you know, at Lola, it gets hot and the bonobos are just splashing around in the lake all the time. Um, so these, uh, this is the baby. Oh my God. She's so cute. That is <laughs> my, no, it's the longest baby it looks like. And, um, oh, that's a, 
random frog. Uh, so this is more of the bonobos in the in the water. And this, oh my gosh, this is this guy's name is Kasongo. Look what he does. Look at that. Look at that. What's he doing? I gotta wash my mouth out. <laughs> Why? Why? <laughs> and so um, you, they're just such playful, wonderful creatures. This is this is Kalina. We call her the orangutan because she's kind of orange. And yeah, the, oh, so this is Monono eating on pith. Uh, the water lilies, and this is, you know, a theory about um, how they evolve. They survive mainly on this really nutritious, herbaceous roots that grow all throughout the Congo. Mm. Um, so this is all filmed at Lole Abonobo. You can see it's just a beautiful sanctuary. Um, it's got a, a large forest, and I think coming up is the nursery. Yeah, so when the orphans first get confiscated, they um, they go into this nursery group where they're raised with other orphans and you know it, it is really paradise for the bonobos I, I can't think of a better place for them except for the wild where some of these guys are going um, going back to the had, yes back to the wild we just had the first mm. bonobo release in june last year and um oh the one of the bonobos you see running out now she's actually in the wild right now she got released everybody's doing fantastic so I mean, the sanctuary just has so many wonderful programs that they run. Um, 30,000 people come through every year, most of them school children. And these are good. And these are going to be the Congolese who decide whether or not they're going to eat bonobos when they grow up. So it's, it's amazing. It's got the education programs. It's got the release. It's got, you know, education of um, civil servants and other people in the ministry. So it, it is just a wonderful organization and a wonderful place for us to work. Oh, there's Maliko. A little bit. Baby, they are they are so sweet looking. Um, is there is there a, a particular way that you can tell the difference between a bonobo and other chimpanzees just by looking at them, or is it yes. just behavior? Yes. Oh. Well, it's it's quite difficult. Um, you know, when I first started, I, I couldn't. You know, I'm like, oh, they just look like chimps, but they really don't. And <laughs> after you know, after you've worked with them for a while, I will never confuse a bonobo for a chimpanzee again. Bonobos have black faces and they have pink lips and they're much more slender than chimpanzees and the females have more pronounced breasts and they spend um, a lot more time upright that I've seen. So um, these are the main physical differences, but it really is their psychology that, that is the, the biggest difference between the two species and how their societies work. And that, to, to me, that's the most interesting. Yeah, it seems as though, um, you know, just looking at them, you wouldn't, you know, the, there are very slight differences, but it's really the behavior. And you, you alluded to one of the hypotheses of how they may have evolved. Um, you know, is it that they had this very nutrient rich, dense um, food available to them? I've, I've heard that the, one of the reasons that chimpanzees are so aggressive is that they're, that food is scarce. And so there's a lot more competition. Is there less competition in the, the Congo where it's just a lush, rich forest? Yes, that's that's exactly right. And this is Richard Wrangham's theory, um, and he's the head of anthropology at Harvard. And he hypothesizes that the Congo Basin is just full of these... It's, it's like... Uh, for bonobos, it's kind of like they're vegetarians living in a salad bowl. Like, you know, <laughs> there's so much food for them to eat that they don't, you know, the females can stick together. They can be friends. You know, if the males try to be aggressive towards them, they can beat them down. Um, there's enough food for their babies. It's just, it's a very hippie, crunchy society. And nobody, <laughs> everybody's like uh, kind of chilled out. Whereas chimpanzees, there is a lot more food competition and um, much less of this kind of fallback food. So because, you know, that kind of gets eaten by the gorillas, which don't live in bonobo habitat, but they live in chimpanzee habitat. So mm. this means that the females can't stick together because they are, you, you know, they can't risk the competition between another fe female while they're each trying to, you know, get enough food for themselves and their infants, which means that males can kind of isolate them and coerce them. In terms of uh, the vegetation and the, f and, the, and the vegetarian lifestyle, so there aren't gorillas in the habitat, so maybe that's, there, there's less competition there without the gorillas. Um, is, there, is there additionally, um, I don't know, I'm just, I'm, the meat eating of chimpanzees. Uh, I mean, chimpanzees have been, have been shown to hunt other primates. They are um, omnivores where they'll eat, uh, eat meat, eat other animals, and they'll also eat vegetation. Is there... Um, some kind of hypothesis as to why the bonobos are 
I mean, is it just the huge salad bowl? It's all right there yeah. and it's easy. So why eat? Me? Yeah, yeah. It's just you know, there's a big salad bowl. Um, they 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 just they don't really need anything else. I mean, the very first instances of bonobos eating meat has just um, was just found relatively recently by mm. Godfrey's Homans Group in in Leipzig. So I mean, you know, maybe they do every now and then, but the chimpanzees because you know, this fallback food is so rare and, you know, they depend on, you know, for their protein for either meat or other, you know, fruiting trees, which are kind of few and far between. It just means that it's a lot harder to get dinner. And so you're going to work a lot harder to get dinner and, you know, you're going to sort of, um, I guess, go through a lot more to get the food that you need than bonobos. Yeah. Um, so bonobos, they did, they have seen them eating meat, so it's not necessarily obligate. They, they, definitely can because they are another chimp species yeah yeah they they can they can eat meat obviously but um they don't usually very much and you know the japanese have been observing bonobos for 30 years and i don't think that there i mean i don't think that there were many cases of meat eating at all in terms of other similarities and differences someone in the chat room here is asking about tool use and fashioning tools. So chim chimpanzees have been shown to um, fashion little tools to get um, ants or other insects out of, out of trees and logs and stuff. And uh, is there tool use in the bonobos or are they too busy being bonobos? <laughs> <laughs> too busy having sex. I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, so no, no, it's a great question. And bonobos have been seen to be using tools, but they don't use tools in the same way as chimpanzees who really use them um, mostly for foraging. So they do the hunting with the termites. They spear bush babies. Bonobos, um, they use kind of, they will use a leaf as an umbrella to kind of hold over their head during the rain, or they will um, eat medicinal plants to sort of, sort of kill them of worms and other sicknesses, but they don't usually use tools to forage. Okay. Well, if you just have to grab a leaf, dig up the salad, it's not... Yeah, you don't have to. <laughs> yeah I'm just eating salad. <laughs> what do you need a tool for? <laughs> like, like maybe a fork maybe, or like some salad tossers or something. Um, but no, they don't, <laughs> they don't really need tools. No. Um, so in terms of the research that you've been doing, I'd let, there's another video that I would love to show of um, your of your research and, and you playing, you, you, you mentioned playing with the animals earlier as part of the, the research techniques. Can I show the video? And if you can, you yeah, kind of talk sure, over the ahead. top of that. So this video, let me get to it. Oops, wrong button. We're going to move. So forward. that's our research group. And there's you. Oh, here I am just talking randomly. Nothing that makes any sense. <laughs> and this is Lola, more of the sanctuary. Oh, it's so beautiful. Okay, now this is coming into the nursery. Oh, there's one little monster. Look at them. Um, <laughs> so what we're trying to do is find out, you know, the difference between bonobo and chimpanzee psychology. This is a, a chimpanzee sanctuary where we work. And um, this is just looking at how bonobos and chimpanzees react to objects because, you know, human children, they're just so fascinated by balls and other tools. So, you know, how is it that they play with them? Um, this is an ear, this is trying to take their temperature. You can see it's a little nuts in the nursery. Um, <laughs> taking the ear temperature of chimpanzees. Oh, look how cute. So these are all babies, by the way. You, the, the adults are about as big as me. So you can't, go in with them. These are all quite small, sort of um, the age that you see chimpanzees on commercials. And once they hit about seven, they're about this big. So you can't go in with them anymore. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, quite, um, it's quite difficult, I think, to sort of get across to people that, you know, these animals, while they're really cute and friendly and furry and friendly, and you can work with them when they're babies, when they're adults, they're a whole different issue. So, so yeah. Yeah, so as they get to be adults, oops, wrong button again, as they get to be adults, um, are they, uh, they're, they're fairly peaceful animals, but at the same time, is it still, I mean, they're, they're chimps, they're big, they're strong, and there's a danger there, they're wild animals, and so you just don't want to be, be uh, really associating closely with them. The only animal I feel comfortable being with when they're adult is a dog. 
a dog or a cat, an animal that's domesticated. I mean, I wouldn't even be comfortable with a dolphin because they bite people. And, you know, it's not that bonobos would necessarily mean you any harm, but they're incredibly strong. I mean, they could pick you up and throw you across the room, no problem. Um, maybe they don't have the lethal aggression issues of chimpanzees where a chimpanzee will kill you. And there have been cases where people have been seriously, seriously injured by chimpanzees. Um, you know, these guys, they're not pets, they're not domesticated, they, you know, they have, um, they, they belong in the wild, mostly. So, yeah, I, the, the only adult animal I will hang out with is a dog. <laughs> I think that's probably pretty good advice for, for people out there. If you're going to be interested in, in studying animals, it's good to keep your distance once they get to be big enough to do you great harm. Yes, Possibly. yes, yeah. that's right. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so the bonobos and their similarity to us, um, the one thing that has captured people's attention the most, we've, we've kind of stepped over the topic a little bit, is the, the sexual habits of bonobos. <laughs> it, is this really what like sets them apart or what people, you know, what people like, ah, I want to be like a bonobo. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, it's what people get stuck on because we're people, we, you know, we're fascinated by sex. What, what is it? 98% of the internet is porn. So, you know, when we find a creature that is having the sex life that we can only dream of, then yeah, that tends to be the thing that you remember. But I mean, I don't even think that that's interesting anymore about bonobos. We have found out so much other you know, information about them. And, you know, I guess the, the point is that bonobos have a mechanism to overcome tension in their group so that they can be peaceful, essentially. And what that mechanism is, it doesn't really matter. And actually, they play just as much as they have sex. It's part of them being kind of Peter Pan apes. They, they never grow up. So they play, they have sex, and they never sort of develop these adult aggression issues that chimpanzees and potentially humans do. So I think as people, we're so smart that we need to find our mechanism. Um, is it going to be sex? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't necessarily think that that's a bad idea. I don't know, maybe, but, for, you know, maybe for some people, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about the person you work with, but, you know, Marge in my mail room, do I really want to be Gigi rubbing with her? No. No bonobo <laughs> handshaking with Marge from the mail room. No offense, Marge. I love you, but, you know, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so is it uh, female male? sexual habits, the females and females, males and males, I mean, in terms of the tension release, is it just, they don't, they don't, they form bonds with other, other animals for mating, but is it pretty much uh, just uh, open season? Oh, bonobos are trisexual. They'll try anything. Um, <laughs> it is, I, I got asked on NPR whether I ever seen a bonobo threesome. I'm like, threesome? I've seen like a twentysome. Like, they don't discriminate. But I mean, the reason why I called the book Bonobo Handshake is because for bonobos, sex is, is not erotic. It's just like a handshake. So it's kind of like, hi, how are you? I'm okay, you're okay. They will shake hands um, indiscriminately across gender, across age. Um, but it's just, it's not a big deal for them. It's just something that, that they do that it's makes a handshake. Them, that makes them happy. Hey, how you doing? High five. Yeah. Fist bump. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's their secret handshake, the bonobo handshake. <laughs> oh, this could go so many directions. In addition, in addition to the, the special handshake, um, the secret handshake, um, let's talk a little bit about um, other social behaviors, ways that they interact and 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 what you're doing to study them and what uh, you, you hope to gain to learn by studying bonobos. So um, what we want to learn and what the book is about is what is it that makes us human? And so, you know, we, we try and sort of play spot the difference with humans and then chimpanzees and bonobos to find out what it is that's special about us. But also um, we're interested in what is special about bonobos, like what enables them to live in a society without violence? Um, you, you know, what's the physiological mechanisms behind, you know, the female bonding, behind, you know, the, the sex at a very juvenilized age? Um, it's just, you know, we don't know anything about bonobos, so anything we come up now is just a plus. So we're so far behind bonobo cognition compared to chimpanzees that it's just, it's, it's just such an exciting field. Like you just imagine 
the length of time we've been studying chimpanzees and now there's another relative that's so closely related to us and we know barely anything about them. So this is exciting. This is a really exciting time. Yeah, it sounds very like it, just the cusp of, of learning something entirely new, gaining so much more insight into our own evolution and who, who we are and how we got here. In addition, just the basic science of understanding this really special small group of animals. Yeah, I mean, it's like 2010. 2010, who thought that there could be, you know, a whole other species out there that we knew absolutely nothing about and that shares 98.7% of our DNA? It's, it's hugely exciting. Now... What are, are people doing studies related to um, the the hormones in the animals? So you're doing behavioral studies, you're checking temperature, kind of the easy to easier to collect physiological data. But are there are there researchers actually looking into you know comparing levels of say testosterone or um, oxytocin or or other um, like bonding hormones or uh, sex hormones between yes. chips and bonobos? Yes, yes, absolutely. I'm Tori Wober from Harvard University. She is doing exactly that. Um, but unfortunately, her paper on all that is um, embargoed right now, and it's just about to be published. So keep your eye on the news, though, because when it breaks, we'll make sure it will make sure it goes national. Oh, absolutely. I will. I will. I'm definitely going to keep my eye on that. <laughs> yeah. <for> sure. <laughs> um, so. In, ter in terms of, you get, we're getting the, the hormonal information, we're getting the behavioral correlates as well. Um, what are, I've seen on your blog, you know, talking about, um, I guess, correlates of human behavior. What would you say is, um, like this, I guess, the most striking similarity? Between bonobos and humans, and humans, the most striking similarity, I would say, um, I would say it's the way they behave towards strangers. Because if when humans, when we're on good form, we can do just the most amazing, touching, um, you know, wonderful things for another individual. And bonobos, I think they have the same ability. So I don't know if scientifically that's the most interesting, but to me, to me, I, I think that's something very special that we share in common with bonobos. And I, I'd like to find out more about that. And the differences or most striking difference? <laughs> The difference is, is that I would not have sex with some random person that I just met. <laughs> well, I have done that before, but that was in my 20s. I'm changed now. I'm in my 30s. It doesn't wash so well. You're a married old. woman. Oh, yeah. Look, look, married, married. Um, yes. And so I, I would say that is the biggest difference. Um, but I, I, also the other difference is um, I think that you know, with the just relating to the same thing is that bonobos, they can exhibit this kind of sharing, moving behavior with bonobos across all ages and gender. And the difference between that and humans is that we can do that, but also we're very constricted when, you know, we come across someone that we see as being not like us. So someone from a different race or religion or a sports team or, you know, other side of the office. So as humans, we're, we're a little bit constrained as well. So I think that we, we would do well to learn something from bonobos. It's always good to try and learn a little bit of, you know, take little pieces of ourselves from nature because we, we're not that separate. We, we surround ourselves by our you know, big buildings and cars and work life and home life and everything. But we're, we're still a part of the big, the big wild out there. That's right. The big picture. And, you know, we, we learn about sonar from bats and we developed helicopters from hummingbirds. So why shouldn't we develop a more peaceful society um, just by learning from bonobos? Exactly. Now, relating to peaceful society, you went and to the Congo. You've been to the Congo several times, actually, but um, how, how was that initially it, to go into this war-torn region where you were reading? I mean, in the book, within the first few chapters, I was like reading, my jaw dropped open with just goosebumps <laughs> at your experience of finding out about human, cons human consumption of other humans, the killing of uh, so many animals, like what's happening in that country? And you went there. 
Yeah, I know. That was pretty nuts. I was in my 20s. I think you do crazy stuff in my 20s. I heard some reporter told me today that, you know, there's a, a hormone that's around in your 20s that makes you do stupid stuff that goes away <laughs> in your 30s. So I had a plenty of that. But the reason why I wrote Bonobo Handshake was because I was so scared initially. And um, I think I viewed Congo the way a lot of people do, like kind of the dark heart of Africa where terrible things just happen. And in the end, I wanted to, to tell a really hopeful story. And you know, to get across that what happened in Congo was partly our fault. I mean, you know, we did this to Congo. Congo is not some isolated backwater in the middle of nowhere. It is wired into the global economy that was driving, um, you know, funding and fueling these rebels and the terrible things that were done to people. So um, I wanted to connect people with Congo in a way that I think um, they haven't been before. What was it like for you personally? I mean, I know you write about it in the book, but um, for you personally to first visit the area and then to find Lola Yabonobo? It was it was scary. It was scary to go there. Um, but the beautiful thing about the sanctuary, I mean, you saw it on the video, it is, it's such a paradise that um, it's hard when you're in there to really believe that anything bad is going to happen to you. So, um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of this magical sort of protected place that um yeah it's hard to be scared once you're in there how on earth does it stay protected like how how does it stay stay separated from everything that's going that's been going on well, um, Kinshasa is, the, the capital city of Congo is a really long way away from the fighting. So the fighting is in the east, which is, you know, the distance is, um, you know, it, it, the Congo is as big as continental United States, okay. east of the Mississippi. So, you know, this is a really big country. There's no yeah. roads. Um, and then Claudine Andre, the woman who runs the sanctuary, she knows everyone. Like she knows all the ministers. <laughs> she knows the ambassadors. She knows everyone. So, you know, if you're going to be with someone who's going to get you out of trouble when the the proverbial poop hits the fan, then it, you, you want to be with Claudine. Tell me a little about her. Oh, she's so wonderful. I love her. She is just one of the most, um, she's like a true hero. And I feel like we're lucky if we meet one of these people in our lifetime. And she's definitely one of those. She has this amazing red hair and she's lived in the Congo for over 60 years now. So she's practically like Congolese, even though um, she was born <laughs> in Belgium. And just her, her spirit in the face of um, what she's had to deal with, her, her love for these bonobos, um, what she's managed to accomplish, just setting up this sanctuary, um, releasing the bonobos back into the wild. We really had nothing to do with that. This is all Claudine. This is her vision. This is her passion. And she is just an example of what one person can do, like the difference they can make in the world. And you just met her. You met her for the first time when, uh, when you visited the, the yep. sanctuary for the first time. Yeah, met her for the first time in 2005. Um, you had somebody else in your life that you wrote about who was not in the Congo, but who I, uh, seemed to be your inspiration and your doorway into chimps. Can you, can you talk about um, the other woman who inspired you so much? Oh, Debbie. I also love Debbie. Debbie Cox is this Australian woman and, um, you know, she's just the best of Australia. She's like hard yakka. She's like totally serious. She'll, she'll go anywhere and do anything. And she is another hero, very different to Claudine. Um, Debbie's kind of chimp-like, I think. And she has done more than any person I know of for this, this group of chimpanzees at Ngamba Island and, and now on, in the other Congo. Um, you know, these women, these incredible women, they just work so hard and they fight for so long. And uh, I'm just, I feel very lucky to know both of them. What do you think it is about these, uh, these women? Like, are they are they very bonobo like you know the 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 going out and kind of striking out and doing something um what is it about them do you think that allows that allowed them and i i think yourself included to follow the path that you've taken um oh thank you dr kiki i'm so flattered to be to be up there with claudina and debbie i'm not quite sure that i am i think that um you know the thing that strikes me about both of them is that they're, they're two ordinary people. They're just like you and me and something happened to them um, with, with Debbie, you know, she was in Burundi during the war and she had this group of chimpanzees that she was looking after and Claudine, she was in Congo and this baby bonobo arrived. And so, you know, these, these women 
the differences I think between them and ord ordinary people was that they felt an incredible responsibility to these animals that you know that they were protective of and I'm not sure if that has something to do with being a woman and therefore you know potentially being a mother um, but they would not let these animals down and they were not going to let them be harmed or killed and they were going to do whatever it took to make sure that they were safe. So, you know, in Claudine's case, she started Lola Lola Bonobo, Debbie started in Gamba Island and it's just tireless and they work so hard. But um, I think the hope is that they're, they're just ordinary people and that ordinary people could potentially do something like this. I think that's a really great point. Um, talking about not ordinary people. There was somebody else you uh, you blogged about recently, not a woman, but um, a, a childhood idol who commented on your book and said that <gasps> you're... A, oh, Alan. Yes, oh, Alan. Alan he said that your book, this is a startling book, page after page astonished me, a beautifully written journey into the tangled jungle of the human mind. It also brings us movingly into intimate, loving contact with our extraordinary cousins, this is a compelling story told with striking honesty, humor, and intelligence. That's Alan Alda. Tell me a little bit about meeting him. I love him. I love him. For anybody that, like, you know, has been under a rock for the last hundred years, he was in MASH. I, and I, I had to watch... Sorry? I, had, I, I have the same feeling about him as you, actually, so... <laughs> I watched him when I was small and it was quite disturbing because you know, I must have been like five and I'm like, wow, that guy is so cute. <laughs> and then um, I met him for the first time. He was on a panel with my husband, Brian Hare, and I like barged my way into the VIP room. And I'm like, hi, Alan. I'm one of your <laughs> million fans and I just think you're awesome. And, you know, I told him a little bit about bonobos and he was so sweet. And, and everyone who I've spoken to who, you know, has met Alan just comments on what a wonderful, warm, engaging person he is. And it's, it's so true. And, um, and he was just so sweet to be interested in bonobos. And then I sent him my book and I didn't really expect him to do anything. Like he must get like a thousand. And when I got his email back, I cried. I totally cried. I was like, oh my God, Alan Alda just wrote to me. I love him. I love him so much. <laughs> <laughs> and then I sent it to my mum. And like, you know, my mum is Chinese. So she's really kind of on the deal with like praise. And, you know, we're, they're not really kind of effusive about, about stuff. But yeah, when I got that email from Alan Alda, I, I think she was finally like for the first time in her life impressed. <laughs> <laughs> you, got, you got some good, some good props from Alan all this so yeah okay mom mom thinks it's good but that yeah, is <laughs> that is such a, a, a one i think it's just such a great story like i've i loved alan alda and mash and then since then he has been one of my inspirations for going out and talking about science just getting to go out and interview people and be able to talk with people about what they do and try and explain science this world of inquiry to the you know everybody else I mean, he's so he's so inspirational in what he does. Yes, and he so. is, and and the human spark, which was um, the documentary he did with um, that that Brian was in, was just one of the best documentaries I've ever seen. Um, you know, if people haven't seen it, they should go watch it because it was it was so comprehensive. And sometimes I watch documentaries, and like in an hour, I'll get like three facts or something. Like they just draw it out for such a long time. And the human spark is not like that. It's just so full of stuff. And um, and Alan is just wonderful. From your um, your experiences, and you're now a research scientist. Are you are you going to be going back to the Congo continually? Are you sticking it out at Duke University for a while? Um, you know, you're you're on your book tour right now, going heading I out and about. <laughs> What's going on? Oh, it's very glamorous. I'm having my like 15 minutes of fame here. It's very exciting. Um, <laughs> we go back to Congo every year, so we'll probably head back in November. That will be, I think that'll be really great. Is it, um, how long is the travel to get there? Uh, oh, so it takes, um, I think it takes eight hours to get to Paris, right? And then eight hours from Paris to Kinshasa. So it ends up taking a day because, you know, we're just with transfers and stopovers and stuff. So yeah, it takes, it takes a while. Is that, is that kind of, uh, is, is the travel and the logistics, are the logistics to get to where you have to go to reach the animals? Has that ever been uh, a deterrent any kind of, I mean, I'm just imagining the, you know, any, any time you've gone either to other, other parts of Africa, 
to the Congo, to South Central America, to study any species, has it ever been, has it ever held you back? Like, oh my God, it's going to take so long to travel there. It's going to, I have to pack all this stuff. Dr. Kiki, I am from Australia. Yes. You know how far away that is? It takes like two days to get there. There's no way <laughs> further and logistically more difficult to get to than Australia. So, no, Congo is fine. I would rather go to Congo, really. Take the best time. I'm serious. It takes like three days to get there. So, no. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a classic answer. <laughs> I yes, reminder, I'm speaking to an Australian, <laughs> the most traveled group of people in the world. <laughs> But we have to be like, otherwise we like, we, if you ever want to go to Australia, it's like nine hours to get anywhere. So, you know, I, I think if you, if you ever go, if an Australian has ever been overseas, they can, they can out travel anyone. <laughs> okay. Back to bonobos. I love, um, there were a couple of things in your blog that I was really interested in. So one of them was uh, a, 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 a blog post that was looking at gambling behavior or, you know, the, the risk taking behavior of chimpanzees versus very not gambling kind of, I'll take it at face value kind of behavior of the bonobos. What's going on there? Yes. Yes, so that is um, Alex Rosati's work and she's at Duke University and she found that um, chimpanzees are gamblers, like serious gamblers. So like if a Las Vegas casino, if they, they saw a group of chimpanzees coming, they would be so happy because they, if you give them a choice, they will always take the risky option. Um, and that's, a, you know, coincidentally, that's just like humans. We also, also prefer the risky option, which is why you know, we have stock market crashes <laughs> and why people exactly. are like, you know, overextended on their credit cards is because we prefer short-term gains rather than long-term rewards. And if a group of bonobos turned up to a casino, they would cry because bonobos <laughs> do not gamble at all. They want the safe option every time. So, you know, this is just one of the many, many things that we're finding out about, um, you know, bonobos and chimpanzees that, you know, can tell us a little bit about being human. So, yeah, yeah. I loved her study. I thought it was really fantastic. Did she compare it at all to uh, the environments that the different animals live in, um, and the the fact that the, the as we as we discussed a bit earlier, the the com competition that chimpanzees undergo, and then there's not as much competition in the bonobo society. I mean, there's got to be some kind of like if you're competing, you have to be willing to take a risk. I mean, I'm I'm just thinking off the top of my head. No. Dr. Hickey, you could just be in this field. You're onto it. You're onto everything. Um, yes, yes, that is exactly what um, she's proposing is that it really does fit with this ecological model that um, chimpanzees, they really, um, they need to be uh, sympathetic to risk because that's the way they're going to get food. And bonobos, they don't need to be risky because, you know, salad bowl. Yeah, there <laughs> the salad. Another leaf. Another leaf. I think oh, look, it's another leaf. Oh, I'm hungry. Oh, let me eat another leaf. So... <laughs> I think we're going to call it the salad bowl hypothesis from, from now yeah, on. I think awesome, you should... awesome. Dr. Kiki's salad bowl hypothesis. I love it. <laughs> no, it was yours. It's yours. Oh, it's yours. You coined it. <laughs> you can scoop me. Scientifically. I'll scoop it. That's right. I'll blog about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. The, um, some, oh, another aspect of, so the evolution of these animals and like the environment. I mean, we talk about, you've talked about the 98 or 97.5% genetic similarity that we have. Um, you know, genes are, are one thing, but then environment obviously plays a huge role. Do you, is anybody asking the question of if you took a chimpanzee and were able to put it in a non-competitive environment um, or, or a group of chimpanzees and give them whatever they wanted and allow a couple of generations to go past, would their aggression levels drop? Would they become more bonobo-like? If you put bonobos in a competitive place, would they act more like chimpanzees? I think it would take it would take a long time, and I think your question, you know, is it nature versus nurture? Yeah. I think it's always it's always both. Um, so it's both nature and nurture. If you did it, uh, you know, they split chimps and bonobos split about a million years ago. So maybe if you switch the environment for you know in another million years, they might switch but I, I don't know I don't, yeah. you'd have to ask Richard Rangham Professor Richard Rangham would have a, a better answer for you than I have all right I will have to I will have to call ask him, him. <laughs> call him. No, right right <laughs> can now can I make a friend can I call a friend <laughs> is it like well, who wants to be a millionaire I know exactly <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna take my call now <laughs> I love it okay so I have one more video 
from uh, this one is from your uh, it's like a book trailer I guess one more video um, and this has some uh, it's it's an animal behavior video people so you you can uh, shut your children's eyes there about 15 seconds of yes yeah, um, discovery channel this is the discovery channel yeah birds do it bees do it whatever um so do it like they do on the discovery channel yes exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we all do it um so here's here's the video and uh if you could just talk us through it uh I, once again before I, just, I, just, I love the videos it's always nice to have a little extra stuff Okay, so that's my book, people. Go out and buy it. Awesome. <laughs> First popular book on bonobos in 13 years. Oh, that's me talking again, rambling. That's the nursery, and this is me doing um, some of my studies with the bonobos, having a look at how much the babies have sex, which turned out to be a lot. So the babies um, have a lot of sex, and they wrestle. Yeah, the babies have a lot of sex, and that's interesting because, you know, it's, it's not something that's culturally learned. Oh, there we go. There it is. So, oh, that's two females. Yes. Oh, another two females. You see their swellings. Um, <laughs> it's me being shocked. Uh, no, that's male and female uh, hanging out. Oh, that's Max. Oh, it's Max. He's so beautiful. <laughs> More water. I have seen them have sex in the pool. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Wherever they this, are. No, this is not where they have sex, but I've seen them have sex in that pool. Um, <laughs> they're just having fun there. Oh, there we go. Oh, that's Kataka. That's Kata. She's one of the bonobos in the book. I love her. Did you become really attached to a lot of the, the animals that you work with? They are like family now. I love them so much. And, you know, we see them every year. And these guys, all these guys, we watch them grow up. So, you know, we, we see them came in as two-year-olds and then all of a sudden they're all grown up at seven and they get released into the wild. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty emotional. It's, it can be a rough trek. Yeah. When you come back every year, do, you, um, do, the, do the bonobos bond with you? And do, you, um, yeah. do, you, do, they, do yeah. they recognize you and get excited? Yeah, I'm like this auntie, you know, this random auntie that turns up at like bizarre times. You don't know where she goes or, you know, what she does, but you always have to see her because she brings you presents. We bring them <laughs> food. We bring them lots of food. They know whenever we turn up, um, they're going to get a lot of apples, which they love. And um, and yeah, and then they're going to spend all day playing these games. So I, I I like to think that they enjoy having us come. They they certainly give us a lot of um, a lot of joy and a lot of hugs when we turn up. So, yeah. Um, one of the things also, your book, uh, some, of, some of your book sales from your past book, um, there's a, a, an organization called the Friends of Bonobos to which some of your donations are going. Um, can, you, can you talk a little very briefly about this organization? Yes, so this is the organization. It's the U.S. charity that supports Lolea Bonobo in Congo. And um, every time I write a book, part of the proceeds goes to them. So if you buy Bonobo Handshake, part of my profits will go to helping these orphans that you've seen on the Dr. Kiki TV show. And, um, and it's, it's just amazing. So this is the organization that runs the education programs for the 30,000 children. This is the one that, you know, has, uh, educates the ministry and releases the bonobos and runs the sanctuary and it is just absolutely incredible everyone here in the um, in the u.s is volunteer so you know we don't get paid anything there's no overheads there's no administration fees which is really unusual yeah. for for a non-profit so every dollar that you give goes straight to the bonobos in congo and there are not very many of them left so that money is uh, very very needed the website is friends of bonobos plural friends of bonobos.org yeah, sponsor Bonobo and buy my book. <laughs> buy your book. <laughs> and buy my book, people. It's awesome. <laughs> Alan Alda says it's awesome. That's right. That's right. Alan Alda does say it's awesome. We are getting to the... If, if, Anna, if Anything Alan Alda says is awesome. It's got to be true, right? So yeah, trust yeah. Alan. Yeah, trust Alan. <laughs> trust Alan. He loves my books. You love it too. You love the bonobos. Go read about them. And then tell everyone about them. That's the biggest obstacle we have to their conservation is that nobody knows about them. So go and tell someone about bonobos today. Oh my God. <laughs> um, and the website for, uh, for Bonobo Handshake, as you've seen in the lower third for today, is bonobohandshake.com bonobohandshake.com has um, information about the book about the author photos 
of the bonobos and uh, people involved uh, video that we've seen out here as well. Um, links to her blog, reviews, and tour dates. You are coming to California, and I'm I'm going on vacation, so I'm actually not going to be here next week when you're here, and I'm so sad. Ah! sad. No, definitely check my tour dates because I want everybody in San Francisco to come and see me so I don't look like a loser um, <laughs> when I give you my book tour. So yeah, come check my tour dates. I would love to see you. Come and talk to me about bonobos and hang out and stuff. That would be so fun. So yeah. It would be very fun. I think it would be, I think it would just be great. I wish I could be there myself and I'm so sad. So don't sad. worry, Dr. Kiki. I'll catch up with you again later. <laughs> later. Um, later. So we're at the end of the show, and I can't... It went so quickly, and there were so many interesting things to talk about. Well, thank you so much for having Bonobos on your show. Um, you know, I I just think it's awesome. I love you, Dr. Kiki. I love your science hour. <laughs> thank you so much, Vanessa. It has been <laughs> great getting the chance to talk to you. I really appreciate you coming on the show to talk about Bonobos, talk about your work, talk about your book. Um, you know, take the time out of your busy schedule to join us here and to share everything that you have to share. It's just fabulous. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Anybody else out there who is interested in more information on Bonobo Handshake, you can go to bonobohandshake.com, like I said, and uh, find out more information about Vanessa and other things. She has a, a wonderful blog for uh, Psychology Today, I believe, is psychologytoday.com. She has a blog called Your Inner Bonobo, which has great updates on the science and lives of bonobos and, the interesting, and, and her other interesting thoughts. Thoughts about human behavior. Hmm, aren't we strange animals ourselves? So I'll be back next week. Next Thursday, we're going to be talking all about your brain. That's right. Uh, uh, scientist Dale Purves is going to be uh, joining us. We're going to talk about brain science, neurobiology. And until then, you can follow all of my sciencey pursuits online. Just by Googling Dr. Kiki. I'm Dr. Kiki on Twitter. I'm Dr. Kiki on Facebook. I'm Dr. Kiki pretty much everywhere. Um, you can find more sciencey stuff. Dr. Kiki Science Hour at twit.tv forward slash Kiki. You can also find my other show, This Week in Science, here Monday nights, 8 to 9 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. That's This Week in Science, twist.org. And I, I think that's about it. I'll be back next week after I go on vacation for a few days. Maybe I'll come back with a sunburn. <laughs> that should be fun. And thanks for tuning in, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the Science Hour. It's been one more hour to make your world way more interesting. See you next week.